and the door swung open. In came two burly guards with Bundy between them, and uh, he was white as a sheet. And as the electricity coursed through his body, you could see his fist tighten with the thumb between the two fingers. And I remember thinking at that time, I wonder how many throats that fist has tightened around. Hello, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me again. I'm going to get straight into this one. Some of you on Instagram and Twitter have seen I've been obsessed with doing a Ted Bundy video the second I made this channel, and here's why. Bundy, Bundy's a rumpkin. Bundy's a poop butt. Bundy's his mama's boy. Bundy's out there trying to prove something to his own manhood. That's got nothing to do with me. I don't roll around with poop people like that. Ted Bundy is arguably the most notorious and beguiling and unforgettable serial killer of all time, hands down. His remarkability lies largely in the fact that he lived such a shockingly paradoxical life, meaning on the one hand, he was the boy next door, handsome, charismatic, intelligent, articulate, and studying law and psychology of all things in Washington and Utah. He was also a political campaign aide and often played the role of an empath, having reportedly worked for a suicide hotline and spending some time doing social work. However, that was only one side of him, his mask so to speak, because he was also a psychopathic serial murderer, rapist, misogynist, pedophile, necrophile, and cannibal who committed a series of diabolical, unspeakable acts against young women and young girls in the 1970s, but God only knows how long he had actually been at play before anyone caught wind of what he was doing. He was known for the MO or the modus operandi of kidnapping, bludgeoning, dismembering, and raping his victims both before and long after their demise, and was only ever deterred by severe decomposition or if the deceased had succumbed to the local wildlife in the meantime, he was essentially evil incarnate. Clearly, based on my last videos, I'm somewhat into true crime. I'm not a hardcore true crime fanatic, but it has always fascinated me because I'm a morbid and depraved soul. And this has been since like junior high school that I've been sort of a mini murderino. So when I got into high school, however, I took a sociology class. In that class, we watched documentaries on notorious figures that deeply impacted society, obviously. Some of those people included John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and the one and only Ted Effing Bundy. Those were the three most prolific names I can remember from that class. These three Three killers were of particular interest to me because of the methods by which they preyed upon and lured their victims in, some of which were just downright ingenious, such as Bundy pretending to be injured and needing help, or pretending to be a cop, asserting authority over people and making them feel compelled to follow him and do as he said, or Dahmer pretending to be a drinking buddy, or a potential lover frequenting gay bars and Gacy pretending to be a harmless magician and clown who frequented children's hospitals. It is sinister in that all of these methods were basically foolproof and the average person would have fallen for them, especially during the 70s when people were generally more trusting and also standoffish. This was a time when people hitchhiked in good faith with total strangers, a time where most people didn't even lock their car doors, they left the keys in the ignitions, and they didn't even lock the doors to their homes at night. So it was a very trusting time. So because there had never been a Ted Bundy or a Jeffrey Dahmer or a John Wayne Gacy, people weren't looking out for these types of killers or predators when these predators were approaching them. It was all novel, it was all new, and they didn't know what to look out for until it had already hit them. So while in sociology class, when I was in high school, about midway through the Ted Bundy documentary, my teacher stops the film and says, this is my wife's sister. He was pointing to a photograph of one of the victims. And of course, the entire class erupted in exclamations of incredulity. It was insane. Now, I won't be saying who she was in order to maintain some level of anonymity where this is all concerned, but my teacher's sister-in-law was murdered by Ted Bundy in the 70s. Like really, his wife's 
sister was murdered by Ted Bundy. That is so mind-blowing. And I know some of you are like, oh, that's not a real connection to Ted Bundy like I claimed in the title of the video. Sure, I'll concede to that. It's a bit of a stretch to say I personally have a connection to Ted Bundy per se, but factually, I have more of a direct connection to him than most humans will ever have. When I started researching, for this video, I wanted so badly to return to my high school and question my teacher about this. Now that I have an adult brain and I'm more intrigued by what we were studying, there are so many questions I would ask. However, I don't know if he still works at that school, plus I no longer live in that town. Also, he hated me. He and I would constantly get into verbal altercations endlessly. We had so many heated one-on-one -on -one debates. Him telling me to shut up, him telling me to stop messing with my phone, him telling me to stop being late, the whole nine yards. So he would not be happy to see me now if I were to pop up out of the blue. Now 30 years after Bundy's death, public discourse was rekindled and the world became recaptivated with him thanks to one Mr. Joe Berlinger. Not only did he create and direct the 2019 Netflix film Conversation with the killer the Ted Bundy tapes where he unearthed hours and hours of interviews with the man himself but also interviews from family members and former friends of Bundy and his victims families but Mr. Berlinger also followed that Netflix film up with yet another Bundy film in the same year another one both in 2019 this one was called extremely wicked shockingly evil and vile starring Zac Efron as Ted Bundy and Lily Collins as Elizabeth Kendall, his longtime girlfriend. Right away, there are three interesting factoids surrounding the second film. One, the title was inspired by a literal quote from Edward Douglas Coward, the Florida judge who presided over the Bundy murder trials in 1979. And that they were extremely wicked, shockingly evil, vile and the product of a design to inflict a high degree of pain and utter indifference to human life. This court independent of, but in agreement with, the advisory sentence rendered by the jury does hereby impose the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. It's a tragedy for this court to see it's such a total waste, I think, of humanity that I've experienced in this court. You're a bright young man. You made a good lawyer. I'd love to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. Ironically, he sentenced Bundy to death, but actually died two years before him in 1987 of a heart attack. Number two, the name Elizabeth Kendall is actually an alias employed by Elizabeth Klepfer, Bundy's longtime girlfriend, who did want her real name revealed at the time of the media storm when this was all going on. So her real surname is thought to be Klepfer. Number three, the entire perspective of Berlinger's second film, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Vile, is based on Elizabeth Kendall's or Liz Kendall's memoir from 1981 titled The Phantom Prince, My Life with Ted Bundy, which was enhanced and re-released this year following the release of the second Netflix movie. It was published in 1981 originally, but it received very little fanfare, not a lot of media attention. Even though it reportedly sold decently, it still didn't get as much attention as we're giving it now. So in consideration of all this, it got me to thinking not so much about the loathsome Bundy himself, but more so about the shockwave he sent through society on such a pervasive and continuous and interpersonal level. By that I mean as outsiders, we tend to mythicize him and think of him as this fabled supervillain of sorts, but in reality, he was a real life human man who interacted with real life human people and who truly, truly affected so many lives, far in a way more than the 30 or so confirmed victims, which aren't even including the Bundy survivors. He also altered the fabric of society and the way we operated within it permanently. He impacted culture and civilization from books to film to music to law enforcement to criminal justice to even the way we interact with each other and with strangers and the way we navigate the world at large. I lock my doors because of stories about people like Ted Bundy. I'm afraid to walk around at night alone because of stories like Ted Bundy and I'm generations removed 
from the original victims. He died before I was even born. Of course, none of this is new. We understand that he did all that. It's been talked about and analyzed and documented for decades. This is yet another media obsessed case that is so over researched and so overly discussed and analyzed that anything anyone can say these days is entirely redundant, especially me trying to talk about it right now. But I just love learning and talking about this shit, particularly because I was given the shock of my life when I learned about him in sociology so many years ago. This bastard became real to me that day when my teacher told us what happened to his wife's sister, thereby forcing us to watch the remainder of the documentary from that heinous and visceral perspective going forward as if we'd personally known one of the victims. That is beyond hair raising. Knowing about what happened to her just seemed unnervingly close. Speaking of sociology, Bundy eventually confessed to killing upward of 30 females, although he reportedly later contended that the real body count could easily be upward of 100. That's not an implausible figure once you look at his patterns and consider he may have been active long before the first murder victim, Linda Ann Healy, was documented in early 1974. People made a fuss about her going missing because she was a popular radio host and well-connected on campus. But what about the people who wouldn't have been missed right away? The ones who wouldn't have been reported missing in time to be connected with the Bundy mayhem. And based on the trajectory at which he killed, I'd say it's far more plausible to believe he killed more than 30 than it is to believe that he didn't. He was considered a serial killer because he killed multiple people over an extended period of time, but he was also a spree killer. Sometimes he killed multiple people back to back in these manic, vengeful, inexplicable tirades. Knowing this, and knowing that we have to rely on an impeccable liar for intel about who his victims were and where he'd left their remains, it's not difficult to imagine that there may have been far more victims victims than he confessed to. Ted Bundy was an animal that destroyed lies and left a wake of destruction everywhere he went. And so if Ted Bundy killed 100 people, for example, just for mathematical simplicity, there were probably 10 to 15,000 people that he affected. So what does that look like in a town where many women were coming up missing? Horrifying. Oh my God. Can you imagine literally turning on the news and hearing multiple women have gone missing in your community without a trace and that the predator is still at large and that you fit the profile of all of his victims? Most of these women were college students, so they belonged to large friend groups who all frequented the same places and many of whom lived together in the very houses Bundy broke it into. The paranoia that must have set in is unimaginable. I was a reporter for KJR Radio, and the desperation in Seattle was crazy. The people were frightened to death. We had started at KJR numbering the women, number three, number four, number five, as they disappear, number six. They just vanished for no apparent reason. We were pretty sure that there was probably foul play some way or another. And uh, we feel that we haven't come to the end of our line here, that we, there's a good possibility that this could happen again. It was an emotional time. Behavior was changed. A lot of behavior changed. There had been young men, young women, hitchhiking on every street corner. And the hitchhiking stopped. We just want to caution the young women of our community to be overly cautious at this time. I would have moved immediately. Not only was he picking up hitchhikers on lonely roads or snatching girls from crowded places like Lake Sammamish with tens of thousands of witnesses on site and in broad daylight, but he was also breaking into people's homes and assaulting them in their beds. The place you figure you were the most protected and secure. The place where you let down your guard entirely. So it just seems to me that if Bundy set his sights on you, there was quite literally no escaping him. He would find you anywhere and take you with ease. He snatched women from crowded parks, from bus stops, from hotel lobbies, and from their own beds in occupied houses with their friends on the second and third floor. Not only that, he was also arrested and escaped from jail twice only to kill again. He outsmarted law enforcement multiple times. At one point, he was literally unstoppable. The incompetence of the police investigators is appalling and makes me appreciate the practices that have been put in place since the 70s to ensure that suspects are properly surveilled and detained and that escaping from police custody nowadays is all but impossible. Just the way 
They couldn't identify this bastard in the 70s who was using his real name, driving the same car for years, and whose acquaintances and freaking girlfriend attempted to rat him out more than once. It makes my stomach turn that they couldn't figure it out sooner. Incompetence is actually an understatement. Calling the local law enforcement that were dealing with Bundy incompetent is actually an insult to incompetent people. Seeing as how Bundy was served up on a platter to these fools by his own girlfriend and by Bundy's own brazenness with using the same car and with using his real name. Also, the way the missing people would crop up in the new places wherever he moved to, Colorado, Utah, Utah, Florida, and the way he escaped from prison twice. It's just nauseating when you realize police incompetence is why Bundy was able to harm so many additional women for so many years, especially the Florida victims. But in their defense, there wasn't a lot of help from the FBI at this time, and there were no national databases to track killers who moved between states, and a lot of these jurisdictions were unwilling and unable to cooperate with other states to bring Bundy to justice for whatever reason. Plus, law enforcement wasn't as educated as they are today on psychopathy and what that looks like and how it would manifest in a person. They had incorrect preconceived notions of what a killer must look like and because Bundy was the total opposite of that, they refused to consider him seriously as a suspect and that's just sad. As a result, the death toll kept climbing. At some point, you just have to wonder why on earth was Bundy so ruthless with his victims? It's one thing to be a rapist or a murderer, but if you listen to the details of the accounts of their deaths, they are horrid. They died humiliated, petrified, but also in excruciating pain. He bludgeoned them and strangled them in addition to raping and biting them. Again, Judge Coward hit the nail on the head when he described the manner of the crimes and Bundy's sadistic intent during his sentencing. And that they were extremely wicked, shockingly evil, vile and the product of a design to inflict a high degree of pain and utter indifference to human life. Things that may have played a role in Bundy's inexorable hatred of women are, number one, him growing up illegitimate and having learned that he lived the early years of his life under the belief that his mom, Louise Bundy, was his sister and that his grandparents were his parents. That's pretty mind-fucking, but also discovering his birth certificate at a later age and seeing that it said unknown in the place of his father's name. He was born at a maternity home for unwed mothers in Burlington, Vermont, a place his mom had considered abandoning him until her father convinced her to bring him home. Learning all of these things may have given him feelings of alienation and feelings of being undesired and unloved on a deep level since his father was absent. I mean, goddamn, can you imagine who the hell his father is? I wonder if he was anything like Bundy. I wonder if he's the reason Bundy turned out the way he did. I wonder if he ever knew who Bundy was, like if he saw him in the news later on in life. Now, there are some people who speculate that Bundy's father may have in fact been his grandfather, the reason that there was some confusion as to whether his mother was his mother or his sister, meaning they thought he was conceived through a relationship with his mother and her father. However, that claim has been denied by his mother and I believe it has been disproven by DNA. The second thing that I think may have played a role in Bundy's hatred of women is misplaced rage for his failed relationship with Diane Edwards, aka Stephanie Brooks, his wealthy Californian ex-girlfriend who he began dating in 1967, who famously made him feel inferior and unworthy and inadequate. It is thought by criminologists that her rejection of Bundy may have been a key factor in triggering his homicidal reign of terror in the 70s, and she may have especially influenced the type of women he preyed on, as far as physical appearance, age, and the fact that they were all college students. He got an undergraduate degree in psychology and also met this tall, attractive, wealthy young woman from California and for a while caught her attention. The relationship I had with Diane had a, a lasting impact on me. 
She's a beautiful dresser, a beautiful girl, a very personable and nice car, and great parents. So you know, for a, a first-time girlfriend, really, that was uh, not too bad. And she inspired me to look at myself and to become something more. She left him broken and in want of retribution. That is undeniable. Here are actually a few statements she made about Bundy to psychologist Dr. Al Carlisle for his book, Violent Mind, the 1976 Psychological Assessment of Ted Bundy. Do you hear the way this woman is describing him? Emasculating him? It's like she single-handedly created a monster with the way she tore him down and essentially called him weak and impotent and submissive. It's like you can see how those remarks would have left him embittered and desperate to prove her wrong in any way he could. Hence why he began kidnapping women who looked like her and torturing and bludgeoning them to assert his power and dominance and thereby shifting the dynamic in their relationship. Oh my god. It's like obviously he was a psychopath at heart, but I, like like many others, believe she helped to unlock something deep, disturbed, and violent within him. Is it fair to say that if he never met Diane, that he would have never become the Bundy we know and hate today? In some ways, I think that's a fair assessment, but in some ways I don't because there is evidence to suggest he may have begun harming girls long before he met Diane. Believe it or not, he actually cleaned himself up a bit after being rejected by Diane and tried to become more impressive to admittedly get some level of revenge on her. Apparently, he began seeing her again after he met Liz in 1969 and basically dated Diane again behind Liz's back, but only to dump her without another word in 1974, the year he began killing. It's very bizarre. Here is Bundy himself admitting that he was trying to get revenge on her. I experienced any number of insecurities with Diane. There were occasions when I felt that she expected a great deal more from me than I was really capable of giving. I was not in a position to to take her out and squire her around uh, in the manner in which she was accustomed, but uh, or buy her clothing. Or, you know. I think I was coming apart to seems maybe she saw it, maybe didn't understand, you know, what I was going through. Throughout the summer, Di and I corresponded less and less. And then Diane stopped writing, and then I started to get fearful about what she was up to. I had this overwhelming feeling of rejection that stemmed not just her, but everything. The tail end of that summer is really a blank. I mean, it was a nightmare for me. In there somewhere was a desire to have some sort of revenge on Diane. The third and final reason I believe Ted may have had such a hatred of women is the women's movement that was taking place in the 70s. He seems to be a hard-hearted misogynist and to see women being elevated and empowered in the 70s may have been a trigger in and of itself. I was sold on that perspective after watching Amazon's Ted Bundy Falling for a Killer, which made a concerted effort to bring Ted's victims and survivors into the spotlight and tell the story from their perspective for a change. It helped illuminate the impact it had on the lives of these women and their families and friends from such an intimate and visceral point of view. And in this documentary, you can really truly see how monstrous Ted was and how hateful he was towards these innocent women who were ended in a way most people wouldn't even wish upon their worst enemy. Speaking of Bundy's long time girlfriend Elizabeth Kendall or Elizabeth Klepfer who will henceforth be referred to as Liz Kendall she is endlessly intriguing to me because she was with him for so many years while he was actively killing yet she survived 
Despite later owning up to one incident where he tried to kill her in the middle of the night through smoke inhalation by cutting off her chimney and the ventilation in her house so the fire would choke her, for the most part, she escaped his wrath. Other than that, she escaped the dangers um, of Ted Bundy. So why? What exactly made her so special? And she also had a very young daughter under the age of five named Molly who grew up in Bundy's presence and developed a familial affection for him. Why didn't Bundy kill them? Is it because they were too easy? Like they were low hanging fruit or something? I wouldn't put it past Bundy to think in those terms. Many speculate that Liz and her daughter survived because she was the perfect cover for his alternative lifestyle. And I agree wholeheartedly, but I still believe that in part it was something else. Sometimes I wonder if the dynamic between them was thrown off since in her memoir, she recalls that she approached him first as far as the romantic pursuit is concerned, that she basically pursued a relationship with him, not the other way around. And so it makes me wonder if she disturbed the power dynamic he felt he needed in order to kill, or if in some ways she just didn't fit his profile, or if it was simply because she met him and became like family before he began his killing spree and therefore in his eyes she was untouchable such as his other close female friends and family because none of his victims we know of appear to have been close to him socially speaking or even related to him hell he didn't even bother to go back and kill diane so his selective killings are very intriguing what's amazing to me is liz's memoir reads like a young adult novel that turns unimaginably sordid midway through she was the perfect YA protagonist, a shy, bumbling girl who grew up in Utah. She had a Mormon upbringing and the Mormon community basically practiced patriarchal principles that made women subservient to men. They looked to men as the leaders of the household and the community and didn't feel it was their place to question or challenge them, generally speaking. Liz was very insecure and incredibly shy, almost abusively shy. Because of this, she turned to drinking at a young age to become more fun and free-spirited. That's how she got up the nerve to approach Ted to begin with. He was handsome, distinguished, and intriguing, and a total stranger. Someone she would have never had the nerve to speak to otherwise, much less flirt with. Liquid courage is what compelled her, and as a result of her guard being decimated by copious amounts of alcohol that night, she invited him, a perfect stranger, soon to become a violent homicidal maniac, to stay in her house with her three-year-old daughter only after knowing him a few hours. She even went to sleep while he was still awake because she was so sick from the alcohol that she couldn't drive or see straight. So the Ted Bundy was walking around her house freely while she was incapacitated. He was walking around with direct access to her small, innocent child, whom he could have kidnapped at any moment and vanished, and she would have never known until she woke up. Fortunately for her, he didn't take that notion, and when she woke up, she, he was cooking breakfast for her. Imagine that. Ted had Liz fooled from day one. He said all the right things and enchanted her. Bewitched her, really. She was impressed by how articulate and handsome he was, how well-dressed, and how intellectual he was. As somebody from the country, she was enchanted by the new big city she lived in, which was Seattle. And Ted was the epitome of a polished, sophisticated university student who impressed her with his knowledge of food and wine and his ability to cook and the fact that he shopped at a large upscale grocery store as opposed to the mom and pop shop she frequented and who impressed her with fine dining and travels to nice hotels. She was enamored of how educated and cultured he was. She and her daughter were spellbound by the illusion he generated which made them feel base and inferior and wanting to aspire to be on his level. So it's no wonder why she couldn't see through his facade to the low, hard-hearted, hateful person he truly was. Can you imagine what it must feel like to know and to learn you have been kissing and making love to someone so frighteningly evil and vile, an absolute bottom feeder? one of the lowest, most execrable dregs of society, a necrophile, a pedophile, a rapist, a murderer, a fucking cannibal, that he had touched you and kissed you and you had his rank reptilian tongue in your mouth, that his disgusting decrepit hands touched you, hands that had beaten and strangled innocent women to death, hands that had violated a child, hands that fucked decomposing corpses and facilitated the eating of human flesh. That is such an inconceivable notion 
I know she must compartmentalize the hell out of her relationship with him. Otherwise, I don't see how she can function. And she did what was right once she became suspicious that he may have been the killer that was making all these girls disappear. She went to the police, I believe twice, and said she believes her boyfriend Ted is the killer they're looking for. And they turned her away and said he didn't fit the profile. Twice. In January 1974, it all changed. Karen Sparks is Ted's first confirmed victim who survived her attack and her sexual assault by him in January of 1974. Despite the fact that she survived, she was unfortunate in that she was yet another girl attacked in her sleep and she therefore lay bludgeoned for 18 to 20 hours, she says, before she was found by her male roommate on a whim. The level of pain she must have experienced. She is now permanently brain damaged, partially blind, hearing impaired, and used to suffer from epilepsy. Bundy later went on to kidnap and murder Linda Ann Healy, also in her sleep, also from her own home and apartment, and her remains would later be discovered on Taylor Mountain along with many of his other victims. She was his first murder victim. However, it is thought by many that Ted's first victim may have come far earlier than either of these women, long before he developed a proclivity for murdering young, beautiful college students who resembled his ex-girlfriend, Diane. It is speculated that Ted's first victim was Anne Marie Burr, an eight-year-old and Bundy's neighbor in Tacoma, Washington, who disappeared in 1961 when Bundy was 14 years old. It's a highly probable situation. The sort of criminal behavior we've seen Bundy exhibit doesn't typically just spring out of the blue with no warnings or behavior one day. It typically has ties to your young adulthood or even your childhood. At the time of his execution in 1989, Anne Marie Burr had been missing for nearly three decades. There were no suspects, no motive, and no body. The case grew cold and remained that way until Ted Bundy came into the spotlight in the 1970s. Anne Marie Burr lived in his neighborhood in an area that he frequented on his paper route and there was a size 6 shoe print discovered outside of her home near the window the intruder is thought to have entered from, which would be consistent with a teenage perpetrator. And also, reportedly Bundy's great uncle Jack Cowell was Anne's piano teacher, so the ties are there. That certainly brings into question if he had always been ill and suffered from this compulsion to harm others, even in his adolescence. He was certainly reported to have been involved in burglaries and animal torture when he was young, so it's not surprising that he would have graduated to harming a human. I can't think of anything more haunting than being sick and depraved in this way and struggling with it your entire life, only to finally explode and go on a killing rampage for years. There's just no coming back from that. There's a moment in Liz's memoir in early 1974, after the first few victims had cropped up, that Ted came to Liz and had an emotional breakdown, which is odd because if someone is suffering from psychopathy, you, are, you expect them to not have feelings of empathy, but maybe he wasn't crying about regret over what he had done to his victims. Maybe he was crying for something else. It was clear to me that he was struggling from a severe mental illness. Many mental illnesses, in fact. Here are some of the mental illnesses that a group of psychologists got together and basically voted and decided that he may have had. Obviously, I believe he himself was ignorant of the fact that he was mentally ill. He probably didn't know what was happening to him. Anyway, I don't think he was crying because he regretted hurting people. I think he was crying because he felt out of control and possessed by a force he was powerless to describe to another living being without incriminating himself. We often talk about how terrifying it must have been to be one of Ted's victims or one of his unsuspecting girlfriends, and we do that with good reason, but I don't think hardly anyone ever thinks about how terrifying it must have been to be Bundy himself, to be capable of doing the things he did, to have to live with those memories, to have to live with those satanic and uncontrollable urges. There was no doubt in my mind that while Ted may have suffered from mental illness, he was also spiritually ill and inhabited by something so sinister and evil as to be incomprehensible to the human heart or mind. So here's Liz describing the day that he came to her after he had killed his first few victims. Ted and I were getting along very well. In March, I had come home from a skiing weekend to find him in my apartment, upset and in tears. He said he had asked the landlord to let him in because he had to see me. He was doing badly in law school and had decided to drop out. I was surprised. I had no idea his schoolwork wasn't going well. 
He looked haggard, and when we sat down together, he put his head in my lap and cried. I stroked his hair and tried to get him to talk, but the words came haltingly. He couldn't concentrate, he said, but he didn't understand why. He felt that he was spinning his wheels. Being a lawyer meant everything to him, but he was terribly afraid that he wasn't going to make it. In my own mind, there were similarities or coincidences that seemed to tie him in, but yet when I would think about our day-to-day -day relationship, there was nothing there that would lead me to think that he was a violent man capable of doing something like that. Um, and that's the split that I think had everybody baffled. He told me that he was sick, that there was a force within him that he tried to fight and tried to contain, but that it just kept building and building and it made him do the things that he did. Oh my gosh. I would not change places with any other man in the world. I consider you a miracle in my life. And in spite of the disaster we have suffered, I would not for a moment ever wish for another woman. You are the most loving and lovely woman I have ever known. You are in my mind constantly. No words could express adequately the dimensions of my feelings. I shall love you forever and forever in my dreams. I shall love you with every long-haired beauty I see. I shall love you with every clear blue sky. I will love you until my last breath. No goodbyes, just I love you. That one still gets me. I must say, reading about Ted from Liz's perspective, such an intimate and romantic perspective, you hear so much more context surrounding their relationship and surrounding young Bundy that the murders and the disappearances just seem unfathomable. She and Ted were happy for so long, for years, from 1969 to 1973. Then suddenly, it was like a switch flipped entirely unbeknownst to her or any of Ted's loved ones. The way she describes him and the way he seems in interviews is so endearing and so charming that it's actually very hard to hate him unless you constantly remind yourself of the details of the things he did, monstrous, horrid things. However, even then, for some people, those very details are what make them even more attracted to Bundy and why he had actual female fans during his trial that wanted to slip him notes in the courtroom. Unbelievable. Each day the courtroom is filled with spectators drawn by a fascination with Theodore Bundy himself or by the gruesome details of the crimes, bloodstained pillows, pictures of the murdered co-eds, evidence that the women were sexually abused. What is unusual to see is that many of the onlookers are women, young women, contemporaries of the five Florida State sorority sisters who were assaulted in their beds a year and a half ago. Every time he turns around, I kind of get that feeling, oh no, you know, he's going to get me next. You know? But yet, yet you're fascinated by him. Very, very. Every night when I go to bed, I just, you know, I get very scared. I shut my door and lock him, you know. I'm not afraid of him. He just doesn't look like the type to kill somebody. You try to imagine yourself in his place and to see how he's feeling, looking at the pillows with blood stains and everything, if, if he really did it or not. The trial has drawn women from as far away as Seattle, where Bundy is suspected of other sex murders. Why is this happening? According to one psychiatrist, it is a mixture of fear, intrigue, and in particular, sexual attraction. And uh, so, yes, I do think this is, in an underlying sense, a sexual attraction, using that word very broadly for the moment. But there is no question but what violence does uh, quicken the pulse of many people and certainly of young women. I actually learned a new word while researching the Bundy Circus. Hybristophilia. And when I think of this word, the main face that comes to mind is that of Carol Ann Boone, Ted's friend turned courtroom fiance, turned wife, turned mother of his only known child, conceived in prison. Let me put it this way. I, I, I don't think that, that Ted belongs in jail. The things in Florida don't concern me any more than the things out west do. I don't think they had reason to charge Ted Bundy with, with murder in, in, in either Leon County or, or Columbia County. Boone says she has twice been allowed to visit Bundy in jail since he was brought to Miami six days ago. Carol took denial to the extreme and now is left knowing that not only did she defend a convicted and confessed rapist, pedophile, necrophile, and cannibal, but she also married him and fucked him. And now every time she looks into the face of her spawn from this horrid relationship, she has to know what she created with an utter monster, that his blood 
pumps through Rose's veins and carries on his legacy in devastating fashion and that she was conceived after he was convicted. Carol would later go on to divorce Bundy in 1986 after realizing he was guilty, but certainly by then it was too little too late. I suppose fortunately for Liz Kendall, not only was she saved from marriage with Bundy by him ripping up their marriage license in a fit of petty rage before they could have the ceremony, but she was also spared from having to look at and nurture a Bundy spawn when she got an abortion in 1972, saving her from that nightmare reality. Although she had already tainted her own daughter Molly from a previous marriage a great deal by forcing her to grow up in Ted's close company. Can you believe? that the three times Bundy was caught was on a whim because of poor driving every time. The initial time he was caught by the police is because he was driving strangely and was pulled over and the cop grew suspicious of what he saw in his car, searched his car, and decided he should take him in as a suspect because he just seemed suspicious. From there, he was picked out of a lineup by a survivor Carol Durant, who he attempted to kidnap, but she got away. Bundy escaped from the law library in Aspen, Colorado during his trial for kidnapping Carol Durant by jumping out of the window and hiking in the wilderness for seven days. He was pulled over and apprehended after he stole a car in town and was exhausted and fatigued. So again, he was only captured having been on the run for seven days because he was pulled over for poor driving and the police officer didn't even know who he was at the time he was pulled over. It was pure luck. In the final time, he was missing for 46 days after escaping again from a Colorado prison. He was recaptured in Florida in 1978, but again he was put over for driving weirdly and the cop had no idea who he was when he pulled him over. Again, it was sheer luck that got Bundy arrested. But this time, he didn't identify himself. He called himself Kenneth Meisner, and it took a while for them to figure out he was Ted Bundy, who was wanted in Colorado and Utah for the crimes committed there. But he stayed in Florida. He would never leave Florida because he had killed in Florida as well. The more I learn about true crime and the more I research individual cases, the thing I became most concerned with is that my idea of a sociopath and a psychopath was completely backwards and wrong. I thought psychopaths and psychotic people were one and the same. That's what I grew up thinking, and I think most people do. And I thought they were both stark raving lunatics. They're not. Psychotic people are people with psychosis meaning they're out of touch with reality among other symptoms. Some of them can be violent, but most of them aren't. Same goes for psychopaths or people who suffer from psychopathy. Some of them can be violent, but most of them are not. Generally, they lack empathy and remorse, are egocentric, and use and manipulate other humans for personal gain or gratification. And psychopathy is an antisocial personality disorder, not so much a symptom of a deeper issue or condition like psychosis is. Psychopaths can be some of the most composed, charismatic, manipulative, hyper-intelligent people you will ever meet. That's something it took me a while to learn. They don't have to be drooling maniacs, and they are not all killers. Some of them are executives and CEOs, people that you see every day. Ted Bundy was the quintessence of this conundrum for me. How could someone who has the capacity to kidnap, rape, and bludgeon a person also have the mental aptitude and faculties to serve as his own legal representation? How is that possible? How do any of us stand a chance? when some of the people who are more likely to murder us are also people who are more intelligent than us. We also tend to think, oh, if I was one of those women, I wouldn't have fallen for that. While some people are undeniably more gullible than others, we will be remiss to look at any of these situations and say that we wouldn't have fallen for it, since a major part of the skepticism inbred in us today is because of people like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer. They're the reasons we're so careful. They're the reason we don't like going places alone. They're the reason we no longer trust strangers. Without them, and men like them, we would have never learned the darkest capacities of human nature.